Welcome to my dad's car. Enjoy. Welcome to my dad's car, a podcast discussing our personal relationship with automotive nostalgia. And you know what? It doesn't even have to be about your dad's car. It can be your mum's, your grand's, your parents, guardians, or even a neighbour's. If it made an impression, let's talk about it. Hi everyone, just a quick note before we start the show. We've set up a supporter programme, so if you're enjoying the podcast, you can give us a tip. Head over to our website, mydadscar.co.uk, where you can either make a one-off donation or sign up to give us a £3 a month bump start. We'll put that towards equipment and hosting costs. Now, back to the show. Enjoy. Hi, Becca. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Indeed, yeah. That's good. Yeah, I'm Andy. This is uh, my friend John. Hi, Becca. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? All right? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Becca. Obviously, I uh, I found you through hashtag car podcast or something like that. And um, you've obviously made some deliberate automotive choices which uh, piqued my interest really as to um, what might have led you down that way. And um, yeah, obviously on our podcast, we discuss say parents influence on kind of automotive memories, et cetera. So um... yeah, definitely my parents' fault. <laughs> um, if we jump into it, what was your, what's your earliest car memory? I think my earliest car memory is probably, so my dad has a 1935 uh, Singer Le Mans, four-seater sports car and that was like our show car and I remember it was notoriously a little bit temperamental and I can remember that he'd been working on it and then I seem to remember him picking me up from like primary school in it and I can remember the primary school and it must have been maybe well based on the primary school that it was at it must have been like reception or or year one maximum that I, in terms of how old I was so that's kind of one of the earliest things and I can remember going to shows and stuff in it but I remember feeling like the coolest kid at school when I got picked up in in dad's 1930s car it's a bit special isn't it yeah yeah I think that's probably our I, th- I think if we're playing top trumps of dad's cars that's probably the leader so far I'd say <laughs> wouldn't you Andy <laughs> yeah yeah it was uh and to be fair that car's had quite a few attempts at kind of rising from ashes um and then being used to kind of come and pick me up from various places and it's it's definitely one of the most important cars I think in me wanting to get into cars so you mentioned it's a sh- it's a show car one of the things I was kind of thinking about earlier did your parents have kind of regular in inverted commas cars or were they were all your vehicles yeah so we had your- we had we had what I guess three categories of cars and I've only learned about the third category quite recently and I find it fascinating so we had the show car which was the 1930s car um then we had dailies that up until kind of very early 2000s were vintage cars as well. Well, classic cars. So they had a Riley Elf, they had a Morris Minor, they had various Singer Vogues. And those are what they were daily in until winter. And this is where the third category of car comes in, which is a Christmas car. <laughs> I like this already. Um, <laughs> which... Yeah, so I find this fascinating and I hadn't because I could remember these cars that were more modern than like the rest of the cars that we owned. But I didn't understand like until recently why we went through them so quickly or like why I could remember them only for short periods of time. And basically from what they've said, because I'm a I'm an REF kid, so we lived far quite far away from family and stuff at points. And so at Christmas there would be the big trip to go and visit family. And um when you've got one young kid or two young kids later on taking, I don't know, a sing of Vogue halfway across the country to visit family with all of the presents inside, all of the baby accoutrements, um, wasn't practical. So dad in kind of November would go to a car auction, buy a big, what what we kind of refer to as like barges now. So like a Granada, um, I think there was a BX, a CX, um, do a bit of work on them. And then 
use them over the Christmas period to because we we were based in Chester at the time that sort of area we drive up to Newcastle upon Tyne area to visit family up there then down to Stamford and Lincolnshire to visit family down there and then back home and then January the car would go either back in the auction or quite often apparently my granddad would fall in love with the car when he saw it when when we visited in Stamford so it would get sold to him so he had a few of the Christmas cars after dad had finished with them as well. Brilliant we've all been doing it wrong all these years haven't we what a great idea. Yeah yeah and I'm trying to sell my partner on the fact that look when I get my car done look I'm not going to really want to keep taking it out in the salt and the, we're going to spend a lot of money on it maybe we need to buy into this Christmas car idea and uh, he's <laughs> he's not fully sold on it but it seemed to work for them for a while. I'm just going to jot that one down christmascars.com just get that. <laughs> is, th- is this a practice they still continue to do? Th- no no so I remember the last daily car that they had that was like classic was a singer Vogue that we called Bertie and my sister was hugely attached to it because that was the car that she'd like come home in when she was born and she must have only been three or four at the time. So for those listening kind of singing of Vogue's what 60s? Yes yes yeah. so it was one of the early 60s types I'm not 100% on the year of Bertie but it was yeah twin headlights um early 60s so no no seat belts probably well no dad fitted seat belts um obviously because he was carrying children and stuff around in them in car seats um even even the Le Mans at times had kind of attempts at ratchet straps to get baby seat into the back of them <laughs> but yeah so this car Bertie was went up for sale and I remember the little poster that had gone up in like the corner shop and at various other places to advertise it for sale and my sister had a copy on like her pin board as a child like in our bedroom I don't know if she'll ever recover from the fact that they sold Bertie <laughs> and um, yeah she just had this for sale sign up in her room once the car had gone kind of thing because it was like one of the last photos of that car and um, after that they seemed to kind of go for it was never new cars it was always second hand because Dad's a firm believer in the fact that the minute you buy a new car, it's lost half its value. So every couple of years going around secondhand dealerships after that. Um, so we got uh, people carriers and stuff like that. Me and my sister were in girl guides. So often it was the case of, OK, we've got to fit the girls, their friends and some camping stuff in it to to get them to camps when they were doing kind of car shares with with other families and that. Did you ever get involved, Becca? Did you go with him to the dealerships or maybe to the auction or anything like that? I never went to the auctions for the Christmas cars. Um, well, I might have done, but I was far too young to remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I remember going to uh, a lot of the car dealerships because they'd, they'd pick a car that they thought they wanted and then we'd go around to kind of a three or four of them. And they'd travel some distances. Like I remember one of the cars when we were living towards Witten, uh, which is in Cambridgeshire. We went up to like Birmingham to look at a car. And I remember it was like a day out. Granddad came with us. We sat in the dealership, <laughs> ate the cookies and the hot chocolates from the machines. While mum and dad went out on a test drive. And then they were like, no, no, this isn't the one. Or yeah, we're going to come back and pick it up in a week kind of thing once they've sorted this and this out. And then, yeah, I remember some cars didn't stay very long because when they got home, Dad wasn't happy with them, so they'd go back kind of thing. I suppose that's a fairly good test drive home, isn't it? If you go yeah. to something like Birmingham and then you find out two hours later, oh, yeah, no, that... <laughs> I've made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, I think controversially, because I think a lot of people are big fans of them now, but one of the cars that was like that was a Berlingo. Um, came home, they thought it was going to be the most practical, most wonderful car and we had, I think, three of them on the trot that were just awful. It's effectively a van, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's just awful. Various problems with them and didn't last long. I'm involved with a, with a Kangoo, which is um, essentially the same thing. And I got it thinking, oh, this can work for work and the family. But quickly kind of realised that it's just not it's not a viable option as a family vehicle because it is essentially a van and well I've seen people use them happily with their families and stuff yeah but like it was just not what they wanted yeah that we I think we did a Berlingo I think we maybe did a Kangoo and then we tried another Berlingo and it was after three attempts I think that's possibly when we went for the Picasso instead 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Bit of a step up. It's funny, isn't it? If you drew a kind of a pros and cons list and then you compared that to a 1960s Singer Vogue, all those things that were right about the Singer Vogue, but somehow in 30, 40 years, Citroen have managed to kind of undo and make make that vehicle less practical than a vehicle that was produced yeah. 40 years before it. Yeah, massively different. And that boot space was a big thing because they were obviously trying to fit, well, less so by the time that we'd got to the Berlingo purchasing, but... I always remember my mum saying to me once that they went for the Vogue rather than the Gazelle, which were the kind of similar looking cars and things. They always went for the Vogue rather than the Gazelle because the way that the spare tyre was stored in the boot of the Vogue is more suitable for push chairs. And so it gave them more boot space. So obviously you'd think the boot space and load space in a Bellingo would be great, but obviously not enough to turn them off the problems they had with them. So my, um, my grandfather had a Sunbeam Rapier for 40 years at least as kind of his daily driver but he had another one which he parked down the side of the garage which we always used to call grandma's car which was basically a wreck and my grandma didn't drive but it was just kind of a bit of a running joke that that was her one and if he needed something for his older car he just kind of cut a sill off it and weld it on his one or fix things up did your dad kind of have that as well sort of a, a scattering of classics in the garden to fix one up when it was f- no no and, and in fact storing was a big problem over time because um, as well as the 1935 like sports car Le Mans I think it must have been about uh, 2008 I think he purchased a saloon 1930s car so that's two garage spaces you need and then he also had this car that he's had for longer than I've been alive but never had on the road that he had been moving around and we were on REF bases. So like garages were available, but limited. And then every time we had to move, it was moving three cars plus your daily car. And so at one point, the kind of project car ended up at my grand's house in Newcastle and kind of stayed there until pretty recently because it was just a case of it was one less car to keep moving around and have space for. So <laughs> Car Tetris on the drive. <laughs> didn't have space for spare cars that were, were there for nicking parts. Do you think the fact that he was based on, say, on an RAF base, did that mean he was able to have a, what some might call a less practical vehicle as his kind of runaround? Because actually... He just, I guess he was on the base already. He just needed to walk across the road and do what he needed to do. I mean, yeah. So like even when we were older and uh, they were having the more modern secondhand cars, it was only for quite some time, one family car. And then dad would bike into the RAF base. And if it was raining, which is kind of the opposite way of how most people would use these cars, he'd take the saloon car into the REF base and I remember one morning it was raining and I had netball before school at secondary and uh, he took me in the 1931 saloon to school and then went on to work kind of thing um, because it was before the bus was running and yeah so he was able I mean he had dailied a 1930s car in the 80s because he'd gone to the Falklands sold his Capri and then come back and he'd always wanted an e-type jag but they'd got out of his price range so he ended up going for a, a 1935 red singer Le Mans but it was the two-seater version and for quite some time that was his daily car and he was based at Scampton in Lincolnshire and was driving up to Newcastle to visit his parents on weekends he did a trip where um He was based at a base where they had a load of like Greenpeace and anti-war protesters. And he drove into the base and saw all of these protesters and they all gave him big waves kind of thing because he wasn't in uniform because in that time you weren't able to wear uniform as you were travelling to the base. Obviously, those same (laughs) protesters were pretty miffed when he was patrolling and shooing them on once he'd got on shift a couple of hours later. <laughs> it must have been like something from kind of a, almost a period drama, like yeah, him, him just rocking up at this RAF base in some sort of sports car from kind of the 30s. It's like, and then coming back and marching everyone away. Yeah. Bit of a Clark Kent in a phone box situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did your, your kind of friends and peers view it when you were sort of growing up? Were they aware of the fact that your kind of parents had chosen this sort of, I guess, slightly more unusual option for for transportation? I don't think they had a choice of not knowing because I'm pretty sure I didn't shut up about it. (laughs) 
Um, yeah, uh, I remember talking constantly about, oh, really? about like it seems longer at the time because obviously I was younger, so like time feels longer when you're younger. But it felt like uh, the 1935 sports four seater that we call Nelly. She'd been off the road, as far as I was concerned, for ages because of her notorious temperamental behaviours and things like that. And I didn't have any concept of what was wrong, but I was constantly talking about, look, she's going to be back. She's going to be sorted soon. And then then I'll, I'll get dad to take us out for a ride kind of thing. And I'm not sure these like year five, year six kids were all that fussed. Um, but I was pretty excited. And I remember it wasn't until secondary school that she was actually fixed and dad had got her running and I was at a friend's sleepover and again it was a case of I got picked up from the sleepover in the car that had kind of felt as a kid very much like in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang where the car is finally wheeled out and it's like let's go on this drive and and celebrate the fact the car's all put back together kind of thing um and we took the friend who I was sleeping over as that house for for a drive and again I'm not sure she was as impressed as I was but uh I was pretty thrilled that that was how I'd got picked up from the sleepover does your sister share kind of a similar passion for it as she kind of picked that up as well or is she kind of not fussed so we affectionately refer to the 230s cars as mine and hers but I don't think she's as hardcore as I am now. OK. But I think that's possibly because I have my own classic now um, and I've built so many memories and stuff with my own classic. That's made me much more into the car scene and stuff like that. But essentially, the story we've been told is that dad had the two seater and then the four seater Le Mans and the saloon car all three of those were used at mum and dad's wedding um, as their wedding cars. So dad came in his two seater. Mum came in the sports car that was owned by a friend of ours. And the bridesmaids all came in the saloon. And then when I was born, mum said, you can't strap a baby to the parcel shelf of a two seater. We need to buy a four seater. So they approached the guy that had had the four-seater that they'd use for the wedding it was the same year same styling but obviously the four-seater version of the one that dad had had since I think like 85 and yeah so they bought that off of him had the two for a bit whilst he was trying to sell the two-seater my sister came along and my mum said you've got two kids you need two cars because otherwise it'll get unfair when it comes to like inheritance (laughs) so they approached the family friend that had the saloon car that they'd had at the wedding and they'd said, if you're ever looking to sell it, let us know. He kept it for three or four more years after that, um, carried on using it, taking it to shows. And then eventually he said, look, if I keep using this car, I won't get any of the other cars finished because I like this one too much and I know you'll look after it. So that one was bought for my sister and the other one was bought when I came along. Uh, and as it happens, they were our favorite cars even before we knew that story so now you're able to drive have you been kind of out and about in that car on your own you've been let loose no so for years it was hugely difficult to find anywhere that would let me on the insurance um and it's the same problems dad was facing in the 80s he bought his car and then went to get insurance and they were like you're under 25 you can't be insured on a car like that and it took him ages to find somewhere that would insure this car that he'd bought. Are these vehicles, like, hugely valuable? I don't really know. Like, I think... Oh, we're not talking hundreds of thousands of pounds? For... Oh, gosh, no, no. Okay. No, it's just the age of them that insurers have the problem with and then the age of the drivers. And you'd think, look, realistically, the 1931 car sits happily at 45 but that's its limit so it's just a safety issue then they're thinking that someone young can't be trusted with something old and potentially unsafe yeah and it's it's a huge barrier to getting young people into these cars because a lot of them aren't going to buy one unless they've been able to try it kind of thing and then if they do buy one getting the insurance has been difficult for ages so it's only recently turned 25 last year And that was the exciting time of, yay, the insurers will let me on dad's insurance for it. But Nelly, the sports car, has been kind of off the road for about a year. (laughs) And so I've not had the chance. The only time I have driven her 
was round a car park on New Year's Day. It might have been 2020, might have been 2019, because we always take the cars out on New Year's Day. And dad had taken my sister out in it to some local garages and taken some photos and stuff in front of these vintage garages. And then he came back and he he picked me up because I'd been working or I don't know, picked me up and took me to a car park. And I thought, well, that's not very fair. Like Steph got all these nice photos and here I am in a car park. And then he said, oh, swap seats. And I got to drive it around the car park doing double declutching and stuff for about half an hour and yeah I've got videos and stuff of that and it was great and I I can't wait to actually drive it a bit more Um, but I want to drive that one and get used to that one before I try the working 1931 car because the pedals are in the wrong order in that one and I feel like you've got enough to think about in the first instance get used to that and then try the complication of the pedals being in the wrong order what order are the pedals in? Uh, the accelerator and the brake are switched, which is fun. Was that how everything was, kind of pre-1930s or something? or just There was just no standardisation. It's whatever people wanted to do with it then, I assume, yeah. Whatever worked, whatever was the easiest length of cable and stuff like that for the cars. I can see why that might be an issue with the insurers. <laughs> the pedals are sort of... Uh, yeah that'll do just put them there. <laughs> but that's standard so as far as the insurers know it's not like it's a modification mm, no and i can't imagine they're searching up whilst they're doing a quote like which order are the pedals in in this 1930s car very true um but yeah so they're just in reverse order in the middle there which obviously if you panic you've got time to think yeah but you you, you shouldn't be panicking anyway in a 30s car because you shouldn't be going at great speeds mm. and you should be thinking ahead all of the time anyway because your brakes aren't going to behave in the same way as even my morris minor what sort of driver is your dad becca i assume he's a pretty competent driver given the the raf connections uh yeah i mean i'm not sure my mom is always still like watch the speedo you know all this stuff but yeah He's pretty competent, pretty happy doing long distances. Yeah, I mean, obviously, those long distances we'd cover at Christmas, the distances he'd cover in the 30s car back in the 80s and stuff. He's pretty happy to jump in most things and, and just go and, and, and see how it goes. And Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any um, any of the long journeys? Were there any sort of memorable breakdowns or anything like that along the way in the old four-seaters? And I'm assuming as well you'd be pretty au fait with mechanics, so probably not an issue if there was a breakdown. Yeah, I mean, there was a few times when uh, Nelly came home on the back of a recovery truck, for sure, because I guess there's only so many times that you can sort some things out at the side of the road, or it would be a case of it would come home on a recovery truck. A lot of the time we had a singer daily and a singer show car so it'd be a case of yeah it'd been nice to get Nelly there but we'll go home swap into the Vogue and and head off in that instead (laughs) sometimes getting there a a little late but (laughs) still getting there regardless kind of thing did you listen to music and stuff in the have they got radios in there no no uh no no music in those we listen to music in the moderns and stuff but I do remember when we lived in kind of North Wales, Chester area, we'd quite frequently visit the friend that had the saloon that dad later bought. And there's a road there that to this day we still call the Bumpy Road. And we'd drive along that in the car. And there seemed to, I can't find the song or remember like what it's actually called, but there was a line in it that was like, scream if you want to go faster. And so me and my sister would sing that from the back seat. And obviously my dad probably did not want to go faster on a bumpy road where the suspension was at peril. (laughs) But we would provide the musical accompaniment instead. I think there was a, um, just show my musical knowledge here. Wasn't there a Jerry Halliwell song which went on about screaming if you want to go faster? I think. Might be that. Yeah. That may help you. (laughs) I'll search it up after this. Giving away all your secrets there, Andy. (laughs) (laughs) Did your mum drive as well? Or was it just your dad? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of their first dates was my mum's mini breaking down on the way. I can't remember if it was the brakes or whatever. So she just rolled it down the hill to where she was meeting him. And since then, they've never had another mini. Uh, Dad refuses. But they did have the the Riley Elf, which my mum quite enjoyed. But yeah, she quite happily enjoyed driving them and she's always said that dad let her drive his cars which wasn't the case with some of her previous boyfriends so it's probably why she married him 
What do you think your dad's sort of outlook is on more modern stuff than Becker? Because obviously he's a classic enthusiast. Does he sort of loathe having to go over to the modern stuff or does he sort of see it as a necessity these days? I think for some of the journeys and stuff they end up doing, it's a necessity. It's also helpful for trailering some of the older stuff now. Mm. Um, So they've got like a, a little camper van and one of the main requirements of that was that it had the ability to put the car transport on the back, tow the classics to some of the further away gatherings and stuff that we've been to. But yeah, I mean, they've got one. They did have two. Mod- so they've got the camper van, which I guess is modernish. It's like early 2000s. Um, and then they've got like um, the Nissan, which mum mostly uses to go to and from work now. And then they've kind of gone back to how it was in the last year for dad's birthday. They got a, a single chamois coupe because um, dad had had loads of imps and stuff before I came along. Um, they weren't as, as practical with a, a young baby and stuff. So he'd never had a single chamois and he'd never had a coupe back one that wasn't a parts car. So it was kind of ticking off the last of the things that he hadn't had from the Hillman Imp range for his 60th birthday and they use that as kind of the second car if mum's out at work then dad will use the the chamois to pop to the shops or to go out and do what he needs to do and and I think he's very happy to be back in an imp. Was um obviously yeah the vintage car thing was a lifestyle choice was your kind of upbringing at home similar did they sort of swerve away from technology i was kind of thinking like microwaves and stuff like that as oh no 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 we had all the mod cons and stuff at home yeah it was literally just the cars and i think that's probably enough of a lifestyle choice for a lot of people in terms of the the get into places especially with young kids and that i mean i like the vintage clothing um and later on like in more recent years they have used some of the 30s cars to go to like 40s weekends and stuff like that because we'd got friends that had got into that so then they were going along with them um no we, we had a normal telly and and everything like that don't worry boiling a kettle in the garden for your tea on some logs <laughs> yeah there's a bathtub in the kitchen yeah yeah no i mean even even when we go out in the cars he's he's always got a gas stove in the back of the cars for a, a decent cup of tea at the side of the road if need be just in case yeah absolutely so um one of the podcasts we did the other day with kind of smells came up were there any sort of smells which you'd sort of line up with those older cars but were, were your parents smokers or no no um but so quite recently, we've got some friends our age into older car ownership and they've come up with this concept that they call boat ratings. And I actually saw that podcast where you were talking about smells and I was like, oh, I need to need to mention this. So well done. So these guys have boat ratings. So they sniff classic cars, which sounds ridiculous and slightly perverted. They sniff cars and they give them a boat rating because these two friends had never been in a in a classic car until I took them to Vista Heritage last year in Peggy for the scramble. And yeah, they were sat in the back of it and they were like, it's got a really unique smell. And like, because I daily it, I don't really think about it. Like, it's just what the car smells like kind of thing. Like you can put an air freshener in and it will last maybe a week but because the seals on the doors aren't what the modern cars are like kind of pointless so yeah they were like yeah it smells like a boat and I guess that's the vinyl and then the bare metal work and then my partner got a spitfire and they were like oh this has got a different smell but there's still that kind of boatiness so they've started like marking cars out of 10 for the boat rating so they've got a Renault 5 and they reckon that the the boat rating on that's pretty low probably because it's mostly plastic and and cloth inside Peggy has got the highest boat rating the Spitfire is kind of below that and then dad's uh 30 saloon because it's leather inside and wood they're like oh this is quite nice it's a different boat like this is your bougie yacht boat rather than like you you hire a boat down by the the river kind of situation but I don't notice it so much because like it's just what I'm used to and what what I get in every day but they're fascinated by it my car's 25 years old it's BMW and I don't know it's a smell either but everyone that gets into it says oh it smells like an old in this car and apparently it's because of the um 
you know behind the door you've got like the foamy insulation stuff yeah yeah apparently it's that that generates that smell i'm not sure if that's true or not but um what it just like disintegrating or like yeah it's like it just sort of oozes out and yeah your um your friends with the boat rating have they got prior experience of boats is that where that came from like no. <laughs> i'm picturing they're like okay they're quite into them sort of nautical activities and the... no not not at all not at all like cruising down a canal as we speak yeah <laughs> battling over the lock <laughs> no we live in the fens it was purposely drained we've got no boat experience really and yeah so it's just an assumption that it smells like a boat yeah i mean i assume they've been on a boat at some point in their lives but like yeah it's what they associate a boat smelling with. Somewhere out there, there's a group of guys in their 20s who sniff boats and go, smells like a singer. <laughs> yeah, the alternate universe. <laughs> yeah, the smell thing. My dad was a coach trimmer, so I kind of got brought up around sort of a lot of old cars. So I am a little bit of a sniffing car pervert, so that I do kind of stick my head inside things and kind of just get a little that bit of whiff of that old leather. And Yeah. Um, We've had it happen at shows and like dad usually leaves like the window or the sunroof open on on the cars kind of thing because otherwise you get in and it's absolutely roasting. But the ridiculous thing is when you're sat at the back of a car, the window's open so you could like stick your nose in and have a nosy about and a sniff kind of thing. And people still open the door and like and it's like if this car was in a car park, you wouldn't just walk up and open the door, I'd hope. It's not like dad's not there or mum's not there like sat at the back of the car that you could ask oh can I have a look mm. inside and dad and mum will happily let people get in the car if they've asked like loves having kids sit in the car they're firm believers in the fact that that's how you're going to get younger people interested in these cars is having those good memories with them but it's the either asking or being approached to that if you just let yourself in the car yourself it's uh, a bit different Is there a a demographic who will do that or is that all walks of life? It tends to be like late 30s, early 40s, but women and men have both done it. We've seen like, but it's, yeah, really bizarre. It's not like it's an older generation person who remembers the car from their childhood or whatever, because these are 1930s cars. It's somebody who's, I guess, just curious. And if they were curious in a way that was kind of polite and engaged conversation with my parents then they'd they'd absolutely let them have a look around get in whatever but they just kind of help themselves which is so bizarre I had no idea that that went on I've definitely stuck my head through the window and had a good look but yeah to actually get in yeah I mean some people at shows take off like their bonnet mascots and stuff or just because they've had it stolen before and they know it's so hard to get hold of another one Mm. and it's just really really sad that you can't display your car without having to remove something or have someone kind of sat with it i think these are the same people that go around the sort of furniture department john lewis and just sort of lie in the beds for half an hour and yeah quick nap roll around in all the sofas yeah (laughs) um so becca you've got a, a morris minor now which is obviously you've kind of taken that choice because of obviously what we've just been talking about do you want to give us a yeah a couple of minutes on that and also your podcast as well let's give that a plug too yeah um so I'm coming up to three years of ownership with Peggy now I bought her um because I was moving out and I'd lived at home slash been at uni since I'd passed my test I hadn't had a need for a car of my own really and also my parents driveway was kind of full enough um so <laughs> there wasn't a need for me to to get my own car until then moving out was looking at like loads of the modern stuff and it just didn't really there was nothing that really interested or excited me or anything like that um and so my dad said to me have you thought about getting a classic because then you'd have a car to get yourself to shows and stuff if you wanted and some of them can be quite usable as dailies uh I don't know it's even measurable how much he regrets that phrase now so initially I think I was looking at uh Triumph Heralds because dad had said oh the parts availability for them is quite good because the thing is that the parts availability uh, I'd have loved a gazelle or a vogue um but the parts availability for dailying one of them now is not at all kind of what it used to be they've a lot of them have rotted and not been saved because they're not the the memorable cars for a lot of people and they're more expensive and things so sat in a triumph herald 
didn't find it very comfortable didn't didn't think it was the right car um but where I was also had a, a Morris Minor so I sat in that um fell in love instantly felt like it was the most comfortable experience ever and ironically my parents had owned a Morris Minor for a very short period of time but had sold it because it was supposed to be a car that my mum was driving and she hadn't test drove it and couldn't reach the pedals. Slight problem. Yeah, that was the first thing that I was like worried about when trying all these cars is because I'm not that much taller than my mum. I was like, am I going to be able to reach the pedals? But no, Morris Minor is great. Uh, presumably it's probably a bit better in terms of insurance as well, isn't it? Affordability. and Yeah, yeah. The insurance wasn't that bad. I didn't buy the one that I'd sat in, um, but I found one on eBay, went and test drove it. The auction ended a week later, so it was 2020, so it was like half out of lockdown, but still sort of. So there wasn't a lot going on in my life at that time. So the week of waiting to see if I won the auction was awful, but it was so good to go and actually pick it up and bring it back and, yeah, have my first drive in it solo and, um, yeah, not look back since, than 30,000 miles in it. Wow. Um When I got it, I don't think I'd ever checked oil and water apart from for my driving test. But now I can do oil changes um, and I've learned so much from owning it that I don't think I'd have had before. And then because of all of these experiences that I was having, I wanted to find a way to share those with other people and also record them for myself. So I started the podcast. I'd done some stuff at work to do with training for podcasts and things because I was supposed to be encouraging students to do some podcasting and whilst I obviously still do that the main takeaway for me was a a good way to record my stories and then it's also evolved into recording some of the stories that I've kind of grown up around from people and sharing those with other people and it's it's mostly for me and if anybody else listens then it's great Um, but the idea is that I'm driving along in my car. You can hear all of the horrendous noises that she probably makes because I've I've absolutely run her ragged. Um, And it's like you're in the passenger seat and I'm talking to you about what I've done that weekend or something that I've done on the car that week. Um, Or I'm talking to somebody else who's come along for a drive with me about their experiences. Cool. Yeah, I've listened to a few of them and um, yeah, been really good. Yeah, thank you. It's it's been fun, and we're I'm in like season five of it now, which is crazy. So I'll be reaching like a hundred episodes in the summer, and I'm trying to think, oh, what do you do for a hundred episodes of me talking to myself in my car? <laughs> like, how do you celebrate that? Get the boat rating team on. Yes, yeah. Well, he's he's come on once to talk about his Renault Five, but yeah, I think yeah, get the boat rating team on and and have a, a specialist episode about how you rate your car out of boats. That's really good with with the podcast, Becca. And it, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that a car which has got so much character like the, the Morris Minor is just it's a brilliant talking point. Um Yeah. Yeah, you can't go anywhere and not have someone talk to you about a Morris Minor because everyone's somebody has owned one. Um and so yeah, you get to the petrol station, you either get a full conversation or you get a compliment or or whatever. Um and it's always a nice feeling when somebody compliments your car. Mm-hmm. Definitely. The the Morris Minor thing's interesting, actually. I've got a list which is in a drawer somewhere in my house. I find it every few years and it's from um, my uncle. And it's basically a list of registrations of all the Morris Miners that my grandparents owned. Wow. And we were having a discussion one day and he was kind of saying about all these kind of different cars. I had convertible ones and kind of saloon ones and stuff. But yeah, he gave me this registration list and I banged them into like the government thing, the DBLA, what's it? And you can yeah. kind of look them up and obviously... They're all long gone, supposedly, but potentially one of them is still out there. And oh, people are still drag on on some of the Facebook groups. People are dragging out Morris Miners from bars like every week. It's insane. Um, and yeah, they're, they're still coming out. Whereas the car that I came home from hospital in when I was born, another Singer Vogue, is happily registered, regularly getting taxed every year. But I just can't find it on the internet anywhere. Um, nowhere to be seen nobody seems to know where it is I've used all 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 the powers that be that I can to track it down I've I've text the numbers that are on old listings of it for sale and they're like oh it went here and then you go there and 
trail goes cold. Wow. So yeah, she's off the grid. Well, it's a, a late sixties car that looks vaguely like a a Cortina, but was probably a lot cheaper than that to buy. And so it's probably just somebody's fun retro car that they only take to little local shows because the mileage is minimal when it when it gets done on the MOTs and stuff. And it's it's out there. It's being used, but nobody seems to know where it is. Strange. It's like a case for a private detective firm, isn't it? Specialising in vintage vehicles. Yeah, yeah. Can you not tell what garage MOT'd it from the... You have to have the V5 for that, don't you? Ah. Uh, and it, if you found it, is that a car you want back? I would love to at least have the opportunity to drive it. If I had the money, I would definitely love to have it back. Um, even though my dad's like, well, why would you want it? It's an automatic and he's like, you can't even remember it. I was like, I know, but that's the car, the first car I was ever in. Yeah. Maybe it's one of those ones that's better just left where it is. Don't meet your heroes. Yeah. Maybe you'll be disappointed, Becca, if you do meet the car. Yeah, maybe. You'll see it and it's got flames painted down the side. and like... <laughs> Well, the photos of it versus when my parents had it, when it's been listed up for sale. And so there's already been a few tweaks and things like that, but they're not irreversible. Um, and the cars come through so much because the people that had it off of my parents hardly used it. And then it nearly ended up in the scrappage scheme. Um, it went to a Kia garage and it made national news, this car, that it had gone to a Kia garage and the Kia garage had gone, we can't do that. We'll give you the money off and we'll sell it to a dealership down the road. And the guy that had helped my dad sell it had gone, look, he'd rang the people up and gone I can't believe that you did that I can't believe that you did you should have told me and we'd uh, we'd have sold it in the club kind of thing and you'd have got more than the two thousand pounds or whatever it was off your Kia Picanto (laughs) Um, so yeah and it's I think it's on something ridiculous like 16 owners now as well but yeah nice bit of marketing from the Kia garage there yeah clever yeah yeah very good well um yeah Thank you very much for joining us, Becca. It's been good fun and, yeah, some really interesting stories. And No, it's been a pleasure. The first of our guests to have had cars, which is sort of probably beyond sort of 70s, I guess. Yeah, a bit of variety. Yeah, some tales of older cars. So Maybe, Andy, we can do a post about this missing car as well. And uh... Yeah, no. Yeah, thank you very much. And for people who want to find you, it's the Passenger Seat Podcast, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram youtube spotify and any other podcasting things that you listen on uh you should be able to find it with that wonderful so yeah thank you very much yeah thanks becca it's really nice to meet you great stories thank you very much bye cool that was a good one wasn't it yeah interesting and um yeah we're gonna have to google some of those cars because i can picture in my head what they sort of look like but i think it's gonna be um We'll have to get some photos. Yeah, in all honesty, there's definitely some that I've probably never, never heard or never seen before. Certainly, I think like if you imagine the cars in like heartbeat and those, obviously, that's a topical reference. Yeah, be good to get Claude Greengrass on actually, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really interesting story. Rubbed off on Becca a lot, hasn't it? The, uh, the heritage for sure. Absolutely, and the concept of Christmas cars. I guess is a it's a bit like a, a sort of a winter beater, isn't it? Really, yeah. But uh, or a, yeah, a daily driver if you've got a nice car for the summer. But yeah, just to buy it for Christmas, just to do yeah. almost one or two journeys and then flog it on again. Sort of the the, the fully paid version of most people just put some winter tires on. But um, Becca's dad was no, let's just get a new car for winter. <laughs> and I'm I'm pretty sure you would have clocked a mention in the BX for your tally i did yeah yeah my leg was shaking a little bit (laughs) popped a pound in the jar under the table (laughs) so um yeah big thanks to to becca um yeah this is going to be episode 10 i think so um series one is coming to a close yeah i think so um yeah we've done quite a lot in a, a number of months yeah we've got a nice little following which is cool some some good engagement on social media now. People kind of asking questions, giving us their thoughts. Somebody's bought us a coffee, haven't they? Yeah. There's, oh, yes. We need to mention that. Yeah. Thanks to Joe uh, Howman from, I think, episode five. His dad had the alpha, which he wrote off at Blue Water. Blue Water. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you're not listening to that one, go back and listen to it. He's very kindly. Um, well, he's bought us a coffee, but he's basically given us a bump start, which is three pounds a month. And um, we'll help towards 
our subscription costs. Our subscription costs are about thirty pounds a month to do what we're doing, mm. and um, yeah, hopefully, kind of long term, we'll be able to get some equipment so we can record these live, so we can go to places and get stories, and won't just be Zoom. So it'll be a little bit more out in the community as well. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, less sort of dodgy noises coming into the into the, the recordings, that sort of thing. So, yeah, no, that's fully appreciated. All the little tokens like that they're really it's really kind mm. and i think yeah in time we'll set up a we'll t- a telegram group it's going to be a little bit boring for joe at the moment because it will just be him in it but we'll set that up um we'll do some sort of behind the scenes stuff we'll give some some hints and and whatever as to who's coming on and yeah we'll see and also th- doing them the podcast live will then give us the opportunity to video those because no one really wants to see my dining room or your office, I expect, no. for a, a, a prolonged period of time. So um, there's only so much washing hanging up in the background that people want to see. Isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll do that. And um, yeah, thank you very much to Becca at the uh, Passenger Seat Podcast. And yeah, we'll roll some credits. Thanks for tuning into My Dad's Car. We're new at this and really appreciate you listening and supporting the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please click subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Give us a follow on social media and tell your friends to tune in too if you think it will be up their street.